Welcome to the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. Uh, we're going to do a edition talking about some breaking news in the NCAA related to a uh, potential point shaving scandal that's uh, starting to break now. And we're going to do our first episode that I'm going to call a producer episode with my main man, Benny Augusta, our, our producer, our MVP that's... Um, you know, really helped us turn the corner and, and get us into the 21st century and get of all get all our, all of our multimedia kind of firing at once. So Benny's going to uh, you know jump on this episode with me and we're going to kind of chop up a little bit of what's going on right now and then just give a little bit of context uh, with some past point shaving scandals that I have. Uh, either written about or, or studied. I'm going to kind of focus on two of them uh, after we talk about what's going on this very second. So over the last week, um, it's come out that the NCAA and the FBI are investigating the Temple Owls men's basketball program for four separate games um, played over the last month, uh, I believe the first game was February 8th. We're now uh, second week of March, so over the last five weeks. Four games with uh, peculiar ac activity related to the point spread and it jumping uh, up and down before the game, or before those respective those four respective games. Uh, we're not going to get into, in, into any speculation of where – the root of that is just to say that there is a it seems to be a point shaving scandal uh, bubbling to the surface right now. So I'll just give you a couple details. First game uh, February 8th was against Memphis. Um, the Tigers went from uh, 6.5 point favorites uh, four hours before the game. And when the game tipped off, the the uh, the number had jumped four points to 10.5. Uh, second game was on February 28th. It was against Rice. Uh, it was, a, according to what's being investigated, it was an over-under shave. Um, and I guess the total number went from 145 to 140 uh, in the 24 hours before tip. Um, March 2nd was against Tulsa. The number went from 144 to 136 that's an eight point jump in a two hour span um, that's crazy yeah and then the one that got everybody's attention last week which i think kind of blew the lid on this was a a, a game against uab where the line spiked like seven points in 10 hours um and uh, it was 172, 100, 272. Uh, I believe Temple won that game. Actually, it, UAB won. UAB won. All right, sorry. Uh, but Temple is not having a season where they're going to be doing any postseason dancing. Um, but the NCAA and the FBI are looking at those four games. So, I mean, Ben and I were talking off air. I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to know if you know anything about point spreads and betting, you know, if a line in a week moves two or three points, that's a big move. Uh, if, I mean, that's a big, big move. Uh, if a, if a line's moving five, six, seven, eight points in a, in a couple hours or a day, you know, it's like a foghorn to the FBI <laughs> to come look at us for, for shaving points or the NCAA. But here's my question, Scott. Why would the gambling companies know they were shaving? Well, this In was re this of... was report this was reported by I, I believe a, a, a sports book in Las Vegas. They were getting inside information. Well, they were just getting a lot of action on games they shouldn't be getting a lot of action on. Oh, like, got it. Got a got UAB it. Temple naturally... game in March should not be getting a lot of action. I get it. I get it. I get it. The line jumped naturally. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm just saying by the amount saying, of bets coming in. Yeah. And there yeah, just yeah. shouldn't be a lot of interest in a game like that. It's not. We're not talking about Duke, Duke North Carolina, and the ACC championship. Yeah. Um, 
so you know you you focus a lot of attention on games that normally wouldn't draw any interest and all of a sudden there's all this betting money coming into it did, do they have reports on the dollar amount put on that game or no no I mean, this is all this is all starting to just just starting to be reported over the last couple of days so we'll learn more um as it goes on i just whenever these people get whenever these kind of things happen it seems like they happen every well i i actually think they happen quite a bit i wouldn't be shocked if they're happening every single day across college and pro sports i think there are points being manipulated every day but that's a different we can go down that rabbit hole on a on a different time but uh at least these big public point shaving scandals seem to happen every 20 years or so every uh uh you know every decade decade and a half um i'm thinking of you know just because my uh my expertise is in organized crime so i'm thinking of uh, past point shaving scandals that were involved in organized crime. The two that, that I've studied and, and um, reported on are the, uh, the Goodfellas movie, Boston college uh, point shaving from 78, 79, that was kind of referenced in the movie. Um, but then if you read the book, there's more information on it. And then that's actually what ended up taking all those guys down. Um, it wasn't really any of the murders or the Jimmy Burke, you know, the Robert De Niro character, like he wasn't arrested for Lufanza or killing any of those people. He was arrested and put in jail for the rest of his life because of the Boston College point shaving. For the rest of his life, just for point shaving. Well, I mean, he was old well, at that time. I mean, I think he only lived another oh, okay, uh, okay, 15 right, years or whatever, but um, and he was like an habitual. So he was. Uh, but it, it was not uh, Lufanza or, or any homicides. It was this, and we can talk about it in a second. And then uh, Arizona State in 1994, 30 years ago, um, around this time, there was a uh, four game point shave uh, involving a, a on campus bookie at Arizona State and the Chicago Mafia. Uh, and then just one that never really kind of died on the vine in terms of an investigation, but there were a lot of rumors and people looking into it was the, uh, I think it was either 1999, 2000-ish UCLA uh, football, Cade McNown was the quarterback. And these were just, you know, let's be very clear, these were just allegations, uh, but uh, a lot of those UCLA players and that that was a top 10 ucla team i'm pretty sure too um and kate mcnown was a first round quarterback went to chicago started for a year or two but they were seen in the presence of uh guys they shouldn't have been connected to the colombo crime family and then i also think of the umlv guys uh, with tark the shark larry johnson stacy ogman greg anthony anderson hunt uh the end of the Shark the Tark, or sorry, Tark the Shark. Uh, college career, at least, was too many guys that were from the movie Goodfellas and that Boston College point shave hanging around that UNLV program when they were the number one team in, in the country and defending national champions. But they never were. They were never. Uh, nobody was ever charged. Tarkanian ended up stepping down because of it. He he had been. Um, I thought they got in trouble for paying players. Well, it was a both. <laughs> both, yeah. Uh, so Tarkanian was somebody for people that might not know. You know, he was a legendary college basketball coach that was a bit of a renegade, a very colorful character. Coached at UNLV, Fresno State, had a second in the NBA, and. Uh, Oh, he had a moist towel. Yeah, would chew on his towel. To, chew on his towel because he hated uh, those small Dixie cups, Gatorade yeah. cups, because they kept on spilling over. Yeah, right. And he, he always was like heavy with the quips, uh, with the media, and as players swore by him, he was the type of guy that would give everybody a second, third, fourth, fifth chance. He was known for taking in a lot of, um, you know, kind of uh, kids with troubled pasts and 
reclamation projects at, at both UNLV and Fresno State. Uh, but he was always hounded by NCAA investigators and dating back to the 70s. They were always trying to get him. And he reached the apex of his career with that Larry Johnson, Stacey Augman national championship team in 90. He came back in 91. Probably, I I say this unequivocally, they were the the greatest college basketball team to never win a national championship, that 91 team, even though the 90 team did. But that 91 team, I was 12, 13 years old. That was the most dominant college basketball team I have ever seen until the last game of the season against Duke where they lost uh, in the national championship, uh, Grant Hill and Christian Leitner. But that whole year, NCAA, FBI were all over that program because of guys that were connected to Henry Hill and Jimmy Burke and the Vario crew that you see in Goodfellas, specifically a guy named Richie Perry. Richie, his nickname was Richie the Fixer. Um, and he had season tickets to the UNLV games, you know, was, was seen talking to Tarkanian uh, on the sidelines would have the players over to his mansion. A bunch of kind of famous pictures came out of them uh, being in his hot tub. That's what eventually brought an end to Tarkanian's career coaching college basketball at that time, I should say, with, with UNLV. He went to the NBA and then eventually came back with Fresno State and uh, coached like Chris Heron and Skip to my Lou. Ray for Alston from the from the uh, and one league. But last thing I'll say about that, even though there were never any charges, I know that there were surveillance units assigned to some of those UNLV players. I'm not going to name the players that were seen in the days after the loss to Duke with Richie Perry at Atlantic city casinos, cashing in betting slips. Again, no charges were ever brought. So you're saying there's a chance <laughs> that that national championship game in ninth, nine... or was it the final four? Was it the no, semifinal? It was the... Oh, you're right. Uh, I think it was. I think you're right. I think it was the semifinal, and then they they beat Duke, beat them in the semifinal, and then beat Kansas in the final. I'm pretty sure you're right. It was a semifinal game, um, and it was. I think it was their first uh, deficit of the year, and they didn't know what to do on that final play. Uh, Larry Johnson. I can remember it. Larry Johnson like drove to the basket, didn't take the shot, pushed it, threw it back out. A guy missed the jumper, but it was like a very like helter skelter final play that didn't look like they knew what they were doing, you know, or maybe didn't want to know what they were doing. I don't know. I'm not, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories, but I know that that was investigated. Um, there's the famous CCN, I don't know anything about it, but there's that famous uh, CCNY point shaving scandal in New York in the 50s. There's the the scene in The Sopranos, remember, when um, Carmine Lupertazzi dies and they call over to Junior's house and Bobby Bacala answers the phone and tells Junior that Carmine died and then uh, Bobby Bacala says, I heard he invented point shaving. And then Junior says, CCNY, point shaving scam. I bought myself a new Cadillac. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all I know about that scandal. <laughs> um, just jumping into Arizona State for a second. Uh, that was the Chicago mob. It was a Jewish kid from Brooklyn who came to Arizona State, a guy named Benny Silman, uh, was booking bets on campus. I think when he was a freshman or a sophomore, he met a young, he met an older guy. Uh, that was also booking bets. His name was Joe Gagliano, and he was connected to the Chicago mob, where his dad and his uncles were. Gagliano moves home, whatever he was doing in Chicago. Silman 
is like a senior at this point and gets the best player on the team or the, I should say gets the two best players on the team in his pocket. A guy named Headache Smith and Isaac Burton. Headache Smith was going to be a first round NBA draft pick. Uh, he was the number one scorer in the pack. What that back then it was the pack 10 93, 94, I think both years. And, uh, Headache Smith was betting through Silman, got in debt like 10K. Silman had the idea, let's shave it, like to to uh, eliminate your debt. And at that point, I believe they were just sh- they were shaving wins. I think. Where like the players didn't have to lose the game, they didn't even have to lose the point spread. They just had to be sure that the point spread was covered. Okay. So they they could they could do the mental gymnastics in their head and convince themselves, oh, we're not really we're not losing for our team. We're not we're still winning, but we're just making sure that the point spread is at a certain point. Um, one of those games, I believe, had a uh, scored forty points. Um, so Silman gets on the phone to his old pal Gagliano in Chicago. And says, this is probably, the story I'm about to tell, this is probably in terms of money, the biggest point shave in, or at least what we know of, biggest monetary point shave in in NCAA history. Uh, And this was 30 years ago, 94. It was four games. um, And they were bringing like like a million dollars to Vegas, like for every game to like spread it around $5 million. I mean, like they were betting big, big money. Um, and they would go to like 30, 40 different sports books in Nevada. Uh, so Silman calls Gagliano. Gagliano at that time was a kid too. I mean, I think he was like 24, 23, 24. But Gag, the guys behind Gagliano are the, uh, uh, Mangiamellis, who were Cicero, Elmwood Park, uh, Chicago outfit guys, uh, into the trucking and trucking business, but you know, serious guys. I mean, these were like real mob guys, not college bookie tough guys, uh, associates or made. No, the Mangiamellis, I believe, were, were made guys. Um, or at the very least, high-ranking associates. Um, Gagliano, I'm not exactly sure how he's connected to the Chicago mob Gaglianos, but I'm pretty sure he's related, son, grandson, nephew, cousin, uh, Joe Gagliano, who was a pretty legendary guy in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and then uh, Gary Gagliano's around right now. Um, So... First two games go well, everyone wins money. Third game, everyone wins money. And then they're like, all right, we're going all in now. Like we've already tested the waters. So now we're, I don't know what the number was, but they are already, we're betting like millions. So I'm guessing this was like tens of millions. And, uh, word got out just like what we're talking about in at temple right now where a meaningless arizona state washington huskies pac 10 game on a you know saturday afternoon that should have limited betting numbers uh is like everybody and their brother is trekking from Arizona State to Vegas to make these bets. You have like the whole campus is aware that <laughs> this point shape is going on. Jeez. Uh, and the point spreads jumped like nine points. It was the biggest jump in like the history of Vegas college basketball betting. Uh, and that fed, tipped off the feds? The feds, and then the feds went into the locker room at halftime. Um, 
That's pretty dramatic, right? Could you imagine? Well, the, through your coach halftime speech. Yeah. Oh, by the way, the feds want to talk to you. And the coach at that time was Bill Frieder. Us, me and Benny being from Detroit, you know, Bill Frieder is a Michigan guy, started his career as a pretty successful uh, high school basketball coach in Flint, won a couple state championships, went, became an assistant coach at Michigan, and then became the head coach at Michigan for most of the 1980s. Uh, had some very good Michigan basketball teams, the back-to-back Big Ten champions, 85-86. I believe they entered both of those NCAA tournaments as one seeds. And in both of those tournaments, they got upset uh, before the Sweet 16. 87, they made the Sweet 16, lost to North Carolina. Or maybe it was 88. Either way, 89 season, the year they win the national title, you know, six NBA players on that roster, Glenn Rice, Terry Mills, Lloyd Vaught, um, Ramil Robinson. He le- B- Benny, you know about this? You obviously don't remember it, but do you know about it? Uh, about f- Frieder about takes, the, takes the Arizona State job like a day or two before the NCAA tournament. And Michigan – is like a six seed, even though they got six NBA players on the team, they had underachieved that whole year. Um, and he announces, like either it was either right before Selection Sunday or right after Selection Sunday, he announces that he's going to take the Arizona State job after the season, but I'm going to coach the tournament. And Bo Schembechler, who was the athletic director, is like, "No, you're not. Like, kick bricks, get the fuck out of the building." <laughs> It was pretty controversial at the time. And then they... Um, Steve Fisher. They elevated Steve Fisher, who was the assistant. And Steve Fisher goes from nobody knows who this guy is. Even in Michigan fans, I don't think knew who the guy was. And two weeks or three weeks later, he's he's winning your... Was that their first national championship? It, it might have been their first national championship. For I believe in basketball... I know they went to the finals a couple times in the 50s and 60s. In the 50s. I think that's their one and only championship in basketball. But that was because Frieder left to go to Arizona State. Um, So five years after that, he's got this Arizona State team who was a a, – I think they were a good team. I mean, they weren't great, but they were like NCAA tournament caliber. Um, Headache Smith was a – all conference, uh, one of the best players in the league. And uh, this guy threw away his entire pro career for probably 40, 30, $40,000. <laughs> I guess you, it's different. It's at diff- the time, yeah, it's easy to talk crap at the time, but you know, he probably That's was still- struggling. He was probably struggling. At the- and that, you know, 30, 40,000, it's a lot of money for a kid who probably came from nothing. Yeah, I came from Dallas. And back then there were no NILs or. Yeah. No NILs, couldn't get paid, couldn't even sell your autograph. Somebody comes up to you and says, hey, uh, you want to make some cash? Well, he needed to he needed to erase his debt because he, he obviously was, which is the. Was he the, betting on games or was he, he just was, gambling? No, no, he wasn't betting on. Arizona State basketball. I get it. Yeah. From what I can remember, he was a big Dallas. He was from Dallas, and he was a big Cowboys fan. And I think he was betting big on Cowboys games, but like betting like prop bets, like betting the game, but then also betting the over, betting like how many touchdowns Troy Aikman was going to throw or whatever. And um, he accumulated a 10k debt, which is it would be a lot of money now, a lot of money 30 years ago. Uh, so the feds go into the locker room. Headache Smith and Isaac Burton, who were the guys that were shaving points, you know, shit themselves. And they go out and they just destroy the point spread. <laughs> so there's all this money riding on this game for these guys to shave it. And they got so spooked by the feds coming in in the locker room. They abandon that plan, play it straight, but then – all these mob guys had lost a lot of money. 
And that's when the whole thing blew up. Uh, Benny Sillman got arrested. He ended up doing four years in prison for that. Um, the mob guys themselves actually did not get uh, that much time. Um, like less than a year. I think those mob guys were able to uh, corral themselves in their in their plea. There was another like Phoenix kind of wannabe gangster that had heard about it, the point shave, and like just showed up at Benny Silman's apartment and just said like, yeah, I heard that you and the mob are shaving points. Guess what? I'm your new partner. And then he ended up dead afterwards too, but it was ruled an overdose. Who knows? So that was the Arizona. There's been a uh, content produced on it, scripted content and unscripted content. There's a, ESPN movie in the late 90s, early 2000s. I forgot what it was called. I think David Krumholtz was the lead. And then there's like a untold Netflix. So back to Temple. Uh, do you think uh, the suspects will be charged? And if so, how many years? Uh, there's a lot to unpack here and a lot to kind of figure out what's happening. Um, I'm working sources uh, in the college basketball world. I have other people working sources for me. I think we'll know more in the next week or two. Um, I mean, no clue if this thing has anything to do with, you know, real criminals, organized crime figure. I mean, that's so far down the line. I'm not even going to speculate. I mean, this could just be, Guys on their own doing it could be guys, uh, you know, bookmakers at Temple that have no, like Benny Sillman could have, in theory, Benny Sillman could have shaved those points without calling Chicago. Yeah. And it could have just been this student is having this athlete shave points. So we don't know that. In terms of what kind of sentences you're looking for? Yeah, that's I'm just curious. I mean, I guess it depends on how much you pocket, how much other people pocket, how forthright you are with investigators when they start knocking on your door. And then if there are people that are like puppeteering this thing, how willing are you to point the finger at those guys or women or whoever? Uh I think things got way more intense uh, back in the 78, 79 Boston College point shave because you had all due respect to the Mangiamellis in Chicago and and the, at that time, 24-year-old Joe Gagliano, but they were serious. But when you're dealing with Jimmy Burke, uh, it's a whole different galaxy of seriousness and stakes and uh and that was a whole season point shape that wasn't uh these are this one was four game the ones that's being investigated right now was four games the arizona state one we just talked about was four games the boston college one was like 15 games over a 30 game season do you know how many players were involved? So there's always been a lot of uh, debate about that. There was a Sports Illustrated article that came out maybe five years after that caused a lot of acrimony and people that were allegedly defamed. Uh, allegations that they were involved in it. They're claiming that that, that, that was never proven. So it's kind of... There was, I think, two guys that we know for sure were involved in it. And then there were another two or three guys that were suspected to be involved in it um, and were implicated in the Sports Illustrated article. And it really hurt their their lives and their, their ability to make money. I don't, I don't think any of them were in the NBA, but they were like playing in Europe or whatever. But... Uh, so if you remember in Goodfellas, there's all that talk 
about the Pittsburgh connection that he meets in prison. Um, well, that's where this came from. Not only was he dealing drugs and coke with those Pittsburgh guys who were mob guys that were tied to Chucky Porter. Doesn't sound like an Italian name, but Chucky Porter was the underboss of uh, Pittsburgh. And uh, there were a couple guys that were low-level mob guys that Henry Hill had met. And they knew a guy from their neighborhood who was like the starting forward on Boston College. His name was Rick Kuhn. Kuhn. Um, so that was their kind of entry point. And then he got the senior captain. Um, I think his name was Jim Sweeney. And it, it reached a point where like they were being threatened. Like, I don't, I don't think headaches, I shouldn't say, I'm, I know headache Smith and Isaac Burton weren't getting phone calls or visits from killers telling them that they better do X, Y, and Z, or they're going to be in the hospital. But uh, Boston College was a different story. Those guys were sometimes being a little uncommitted, I guess would be the word, to the shave while it was going on. And, and some of the mob guys felt like these guys weren't 100% invested in it. Uh, and I think in one situation, they they – they came with a group of them and sat like behind the basket where you're shooting free throws. And like to show Sweeney, like you better be in on this. We can and touch I, you. Yeah. yeah. And I think Sweeney said that, I don't know if it was Jimmy or Henry said to him, like, if you don't do this, like we're going to break your legs. <laughs> like there'll be no more basketball for you. Um, so that was a year long shave that nobody knew about for two years until Henry Hill flipped. And it's, it's interesting how that whole Goodfellas bus came up, came to be. You see, remember at the end of the movie or near the end of the movie, he's going to take the babysitter to go get her hat. And he's like, I thought the feds were following me when in reality it was just the local cops. Cause only local cops talk like that. Like, you, sh you shut the motor off. I'm going to shoot you in the head, motherfucker. Um, that scene. Well, he Henry Hill got busted on a local drug case, a county drug case, where he had an 18-year-old kid moving coke and pills and marijuana for him. And the 18-year-old kid flipped. Um, and his dad was a member of the Henry Hill, Jimmy Burke group. Um, and if you remember... In the movie, the last time Henry sees Jimmy, they're at a diner and he asked Jimmy to go kill. The, that was the kid who they eventually did kill. This 18 year old kid gets killed like a month or something after Henry Hill flips. And then Henry Hill gives them Boston College, not realizing that it's even a crime, or at least if you believe Henry Hill. He was saying, I didn't even realize this was illegal. And then that brings Jimmy Burke down. So it was an 18-year-old kid who was moving fucking quaaludes out of a Long Island high school parking lot and the Boston College point-shaving scandal that actually brought down that entire Goodfellas crew. How much time was Henry Hill looking at? Or did they know he was... Oh, that what Hill was looking at life, life. For, all that, for all that other stuff. I okay, he, so they t the feds tied it. I think okay. he was debriefing, like you would debrief, and you know you got to tell them everything you've done. And I think he mentioned this kind of like, oh, by the way, we did this, not realizing that it was like a big deal. And the guy that he was debriefing for, Ed McDonald, had played basketball at Boston College, so he was like very, you know, his ears perked up when he saw that, and he knew that it was a way to to get Burke. Mm. So, yeah, it was in addition to all the murders and drugs and thefts and racketeering that that Henry um, admitted to when they popped him. And if you remember, he and rightly so, he flipped because he knew or thought that the Vario crew and Jimmy Burke were going to kill him.
what do you think, Benny? Do you think Karen, if she would have gone back into that uh, alleyway, would she have uh, made it made her way back to Henry? I don't think so. I don't either. At least how they portrayed it, how the director portrayed, it, how Scorsese portrayed it. Um. Oh, yeah, just around the corner. Just around the it corner. Just, I don't think she makes it out. Another piece of trivia I, I always like to tell people that um, most people don't know is that Karen was sleeping with Pauly in the movie. Not in the movie, in real life. Um, so Karen wasn't necessarily all... Uh, well, there's the scene... Uh, with with the debriefer, like, don't give me the babe in the woods routine, Karen. I heard you on those wiretaps. You're talking about cocaine. Yeah, but besides that, she was, you know, they obviously the character they didn't want to make the character out to be, you know, slutty or or uh, promiscuous. But in reality, um, that was going on. Henry Hill's wife was sleeping with his boss, so. Another thing was that even if Jimmy or Tommy wanted to hurt Karen, I don't think they could have. Unless I'm misreading it and uh, Polly uh, would have had her killed too. I think mean, it's very possible. Uh, so I guess we'll just keep people updated on what's going on in Philly with Temple. You know, it's a pretty, um, that, that program's got a lot of, you know, tradition. You know, John Cheney. Um, I remember those Temple teams uh, in the 80s and 90s uh, were always top 15 squads. A couple of them got to, I think, the Elite Eight. Never made it to the Final Four, but. Wasn't uh, Bill Cosby a huge Temple fan? Yeah, yes. He played football at Temple. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. And did he make like a wager with the somebody? Curse, the curse of Bill Cosby is coming back on the Temple Owls. <laughs> Yeah. Who knows? We'll see. Benny, thanks for joining me. Thanks for being a sounding board, listening to me uh, ramble and give out random facts and spew useless information. No, this was good. But uh, yeah, we'll keep everybody updated on what's going on. But those those point shave shifts over the last couple of weeks were just screaming out to be looked at. And now they're being looked at. So we'll see. Thank you, Benny. Thanks, everyone. Uh, check back for another Long form or quick edition of the OG pod only here at OG pod. I'm Scott Bernstein. Out. Oh.